I cannot wait to find out what happened to Luke, Han, and Leia after the return of the Jedi. Episode 1? Episode 1? Does that mean this story's going backwards literally and figuratively? The problem here is, of course, back in 1981, George Lucas renamed Star Wars to Star Wars Episode 4, A New Hope, which insinuates that there were three stories that came before it, that there would be prequels hadn't been a surprise for 18 years up until that point. Also, I didn't read any of that let alone comprehend it. But wouldn't you need to have read it in order to comprehend it in the first place? Funny, since the days of episode 4, which is technically after this movie's events, how much extra technology this era has over its successor. Hey Jeremy, these are droids, and you know what else was a droid in episode 4? C-3PO! And if you want to be pedantic, these particular droids are made by the Separatists, and the entire point of the Clone Wars era is to show how the Separatists were defeated and their tech destroyed. This way, please. When our high-ranking political guests have to walk at the slow-ass pace of a droid like this, maybe we've taken the robot workers concept too far. He says while showing TC-14 moving at a brisk jog. I have a bad feeling about this. Come with me if you want to live. Jeremy makes a pop culture reference that isn't a sin of the movie cliche. Also, god damn it, this stupid ass rat tail. I thought various ponytails were for either preventing hair from getting in the way or to be cool. This is neither. Discuss. Jeremy hates chicken heads. Struggle tails need love too. The ambassadors are Jedi Knights, I believe. Why would the Chancellor send obvious Jedi to the Trade Federation when it's pretty obvious they would never agree to enter the same room with them? Sending Jedi to something like this is almost like declaring war. At least make them not dress like Jedi so it can be a surprise. Chancellor Valorum has no idea Darth Sidious has been manipulating these people. Naturally, neither do the Jedi, so they were sent here to negotiate. The only reason you know this is a bad thing is because you already have outside information the characters within the film do not have. Kill them immediately. As you wish. Because killing Jedi is easy. We're on it, boss. That was a direct order from Lord Sidious. What are they supposed to do? Not even try? Can you send gas to just one room when you feed it into the air conditioning system? Or was this room created by Spectre to execute people you don't like on a whim? Yes, because I'm sure those were the only two options. Check it out, Corporal. We'll cover you. Robot soldiers have corporals? Sure, why not? These droids all have AI, and this scene literally shows it. If they weren't autonomous, there would have been no need for one droid to tell the other to do something. The answer is right in your face. <laughs> all this destruction, and there isn't any smoke, scratch marks, burns, or anything marking a battle took place other than some ruined droids. If you want to know why subconsciously you were hating this movie, it's little details like that. Or you're watching a small-scale fight between two Jedi and eight battle droids. Master! Destroy us! This movie suddenly becomes like a video game where the bad guys send new enemies for the hero to fight, but just two of them so the game doesn't get too challenging too fast. Maybe droidicas are just too resource heavy to create, naturally limiting the amount of them. Or destroyer droids are really, really good at what they do, so you only need two. Even if none of this is true, the movie is showing that the Viceroy underestimates what it takes to defeat Jedi, which isn't so much a flaw of the film, but a flaw of the character within the film. A communications disruption can mean only one thing. Invasion. What? Do you not know about asteroids and other space anomalies? Are communications always perfect for you assholes? This is like asking Avengers Endgame era Iron Man has he finally figured out the icing problem. I will not condone a course of action that will lead us to war. But I will condone this hairdo I'm sporting, which surely cost gobs of government dollars, but whatever. Jeremy sends Queen Amidala style, which is worth at least five cents. I'm guessing in 2019, George Lucas will want to add some more lizards to this shot so that it will finally be complete. Except that joke doesn't work because George Lucas sold the rights to Star Wars three years before you made this video. Glad we could see the camera follow this chunk of sprites falling to the ground to add to our enjoyment. I don't know. Qui-Gon f***ing shit up kind of makes it hot. Yusa go into the bosses. Yusa in big doo-doo this time. Yusa in big doo-doo this time. It's not a sin if it makes you laugh. And if you didn't laugh... Yusa in big doo-doo this time. Yusa in big doo-doo this time. Yusa in big doo doo 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 this time. You 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 this time. A droid army is about to attack the Naboo. We must warn them. We shall no like the Naboo. Wait, I thought Naboo was the name of the planet. It is, but it's also the name of the people, numbnuts. You and the Naboo form a symbiont circle. What happens to one of you will affect the other. You must understand this. It appears that the Gungans and the Naboo are completely separate from each other. These guys live in what is basically a secret underwater city and do fine without one another, so I don't get it. The point is that should Naboo get invaded, the invaders might not want to live in peace with the Gungans when they find them there and may even attempt to exploit or enslave them. He owes me what you call a life debt. Your gods demand that his life belongs to me now. 
I know this because I know everything about your culture I just learned existed five minutes ago. I mean, seriously, he just had this exchange with Obi-Wan. Master, what's a bongo? A transport, I hope. But now he's suddenly an expert on Gungan law. What the hell? Jar Jar explicitly tells Qui-Gon about the life debt in the previous scene. You almost got us killed. Are you brainless? I speak! The ability to speak does not make you intelligent. Now get out of here. No, no, Mr. Stay! Mr. Your humble servant! That won't be necessary. Oh, but it is! It is demanded by the gods, it is! Where is it going? Don't worry. The Force will guide us. The Force also guided you to nearly getting eaten by a gooberfish just a second ago. Why do we trust this Force anyway? 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 <laughs> oh shit! Why are these invading ships attacking in a straight line instead of a super wide front? I don't know, Jeremy. It couldn't possibly be the rugged terrain on either side of this screen, now could it? Viceroy, we have captured the Queen. Ah, victory! Wait, they captured the Queen without a fight? That's not so much a victory as it is a forfeit. Jeremy doesn't know that if your opponent forfeits, it's still a victory. I guess all those chess grandmasters aren't actually grandmasters, according to this logic. This is actually fake Queen Amidala, played by Kira Knightley. And this trailing servant is actually Natalie Portman, the real queen, which you only really notice on your second or third viewing. But my question is, what the f*** are you doing watching this a second or third time? Jeremy sends something he likes, cliche. They need her to sign a treaty to make this invasion of theirs legal. They can't afford to kill her. What? They need her to sign a treaty to make the invasion of her home planet legal? If you're a fully functioning adult, you understand what Panaka is saying here. He's calling this an invasion, but if it were legal, it would be called colonization. Get it? Movie substitutes the previous robot action scenes in like we won't notice. That would be a whole lot funnier if there weren't a big-ass Naboo starfighter in the background. Every droid but R2-D2 gets shot off the surface of the ship like bottles on Kid Rock's fence. R2, though, that f***er is indestructible, of course. R2-D2 is made important to the story because he didn't get destroyed. You always do this. You suggest it's convenient that a character survives or is in the right place at the right time, but you fail to understand the story happens because they're there. This is a prequel. R2 isn't important yet, and he only is important because you've seen the previous movies. For someone watching these movies in chronological order for the first time, this isn't a problem. It's like complaining about a character in a September 11th movie surviving when the movie was only made about them because they survived. And that's saying nothing about these droids' crazy ability to drive on the exterior surface of a moving spaceship. This is because since they are in a vacuum and there is no wind resistance, the difference between the ship's momentum and the droids is zero. In other words, try walking inside an airplane or train. I want to know how holograms actually work. Is there a booth you step inside? From the Emperor's perspective, does he see these two guys sitting down as holograms on opposite sides of a table? If so, what- Oh my god, who the hell Cares. Oh. <laughs> Fine, even if this movie is for kids, even if Jar Jar was made for kids, no matter what excuse you give me, this stepping in shit scene is basically a metaphor for the whole franchise. Name one great kids movie that has a scene like this. Go ahead, I'm waiting. Are you asking for good kids movies with poop humor? Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, Despicable Me, The Lion King, A Bug's Life, Toy Story 3. I mean, this list literally goes on and on. If you're asking which movie specifically has a character stepping in poo, I could easily list those too, but I think it's more interesting that you're advocating for all movies to be the same. I mean, do you think children's movies should all follow the same formula? Because that's what this sounds like. If you subscribe to the brand new and totally insane internet theory that Jar Jar was originally intended to be a Yoda-like evil Jedi master this whole time, how do you explain this Three's Company bull That should have tipped you off that listening to literally any fan theories regarding Star Wars is probably an idea best left for dumbasses. Credits will do fine. No, they won't! Think you're some kind of Jedi waving your hand around like that? This didn't work against Jabba, and it didn't work against this pissant. So if the Force is only good against the weak-minded, what good is it? It should be able to take down some smarter creatures too, if it's worth a damn. This isn't the Force. This is the Jedi mind trick, and this is the limitation of this particular usage of the Force. Qui-Gon could just as easily Force choke this bitch and call it an evening, but you see this hair? That means unless you're brandishing a red lightsaber, he's Space Jesus. This storm will slow them down. Looks pretty bad. It does? I mean, I hear wind sound effects, and the picture is a tiny bit blurry, but... As a viewer, I've been given no indication of a super serious sudden sandstorm or its severity. You mean the scene literally four seconds before this, you goddamn liar? This storm will slow them down. 
Come on, I'll take you to my place. Because sandstorms are very, very dangerous, and this sandstorm happened to coincide with a time when the Jedi and company were humoring a little boy tour guide, the rest of all the Star Wars can happen. Yeah, so what's your point? Oh, hello. I don't believe we have been introduced. Movie takes a character introduction that should feel epic and makes it feel... What's the opposite of epic? CinemaSins? What if this plan fails, Master? By the way, movie sticks Obi-Wan on this ship, doing nothing, the entire time on Tatooine. That's exactly what we wanted to see the badass character from the original trilogy do, now didn't we? Listen, I love Obi-Wan Kenobi. His show is probably my most anticipated TV show at this point, other than season three of Kagegurui. But nowhere in the original trilogy was Obi-Wan shown to be a badass. It wasn't until this, The Clone Wars, and the next two prequel films where Obi-Wan showed how great he was, so please cut the shit. Who was his father? There was no father. Wow, way to Jesus Christ the Anakin character. You know what would have been way more interesting? Almost any mysterious character from the galaxy impregnating you and then leaving. You could have even made that a big surprise reveal in the third movie somehow. Anything but this. Boy, do I got news for you. But first... Do you ever hear the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise? Qui-Gon practices the Jedi way and cheats at the dice throw. Shit, he should just use his Jedi powers to sabotage the race if he's going to subvert honesty anyway. Except he doesn't have to do that because he's seen how strong Anakin is with the Force, so he knows Anakin is going to win. You know, chosen one and all. And just like last time, 10 sins for splitting this video into two videos. It's a great strategy, I will admit, but getting people to click twice for what should be the same video? Only a Sith could come up with such a thing. Alien rat carcasses here. Get your alien rat carcasses here. Jeremy is enjoying this movie far more than he's letting on. Oh, isn't that cute? This movie thinks it's been her. Which one, the 1959 remake or the 2016 remake? Because if it's the latter, I'll go out on a limb and say this entire film is a masterpiece compared to that bullshit. Our meeting was not a coincidence. Yeah, it was. Look at the things that had to happen before they ran into Anakin. He had to stumble on Jar Jar on another planet, take him in, have him show them where his home was, get released by the Gungans, survive going through the Naboo Corps, have ship problems on the way to another planet, just happen to land on Tatooine, befriend the child slave of a guy who sold the part they needed, and then have Jar Jar accidentally get into a fight with a professional pod racer so Anakin could break it up. Even then, the kid just kind of joined him without an invite. And I still don't think he cleaned those racks. Again, you're failing to understand what a convenience actually is. The only reason you're suggesting that this is a convenience is because this is a prequel and you know the outcome already. If this movie was the first movie that was released in this series, you wouldn't know what the ramifications of all these events were and would not be calling them a convenience. Padme will go from maternal figure in this film to sexual partner in the next. Like that. And that is creepy as f You mean sisterly figure. And yeah, that might be creepy to us, but let's not piss off them boys in Alabama. They got yellow flags and don't wear masks. Space is cold. It sure is, but aren't you on a ship? Doesn't it have heat? You're saying this to a child that has lived on a desert planet his entire life. Have you not seen little Nikki? I don't need this to remember you by. Because we already have a creepy romantic connection that won't be spoken of aloud until you're old enough for me to see your Jabor snippet, if you know what I mean. Wink. Jeremy says boner. I'm grateful for your concern, Chancellor. Do you think that maybe this fake queen has actually been playing the queen for so long she's gone too deep undercover? You think maybe she feels like she's actually the queen right now? Asking irrelevant questions. The courts take even longer to decide things than the Senate. They do? Well, sh <laughs> Okay. Okay, I laughed. The cells have the highest concentration of midichlorians I have seen in a life form. Therefore, he's a good guy, I think. It's either that or allow this potentially powerful being to fall to the dark side and kill innumerable amounts of younglings. Wait. You refer to the prophecy of the one who will bring balance to the Force. No, because Star Wars would never do anything as stupid as having some ancient prophecy muddy the waters, right? Who makes these prophecies? The Wills. Next question. Mm, afraid to lose her, I think. Mm? Well, sh wouldn't you be too? Jedi Council makes it out like loving your mom is bad, assholes. That's kind of Anakin's problem, though. He loves too hard. When you love someone to the point where you'll betray everything you stand for, you might want to get some counseling, not develop godlike powers and brandish invincible laser swords. Just saying. Also, if you're telling me no Jedi has ever had fears, fuck you, Yoda. You're a liar and a dickhead. Everyone has fears. Why don't you just teach the kid how to move beyond them instead of acting like he's a total cheese for even having them? To everyone's absolute surprise, CinemaSins completely misunderstands the point here. Yoda is suggesting to not allow one's fears to dictate their actions. Anakin specifically allows his fears to consume him to the point that he literally follows a motherfucker named Darth Sidious. Sidious! No, he will not be trained. Yoda just went on a rant about how fear leads to the dark side, but isn't the council practicing fear by not allowing the training of Anakin? Is it really fear if I know having sex without a condom could lead to STDs so I don't do it? 
Or would you call that intelligence? Lucas deserves any and all sins that might otherwise have been directed at the actors in this movie. Guys, there is literally no justification for this sin. It's just this frame and Jeremy saying this one line. Also, in the span of six seconds, Jar Jar hits more targets than all the stormtroopers in the entire Star Wars franchise combined, and on accident. 2015 Cinema Sins has obviously never seen that one episode of The Mandalorian. You know which one I'm talking about. Birds! Good, good. I sense your fear. Penguin, press the sin button for me. I'm cleaning my lightsaber. Y yes my master. Darth Maul taunts Obi-Wan here, but wouldn't it be pretty easy for him to kill Obi-Wan by, like, spear-throwing his lightsaber five feet down into Obi-Wan's face? I mean, where's he gonna go to dodge that shit? So you think it's a good idea to throw your only weapon at a Force user? Whose mans is this? <laughs> Darth Maul stands perfectly still while Obi-Wan does all this bullshit to kill him. All of this is supposed to be happening at the reaction speed of a Jedi, which is supposed to be really, really fast. It looks slow to us because this movie was made in 1997. Also, the coolest character this trilogy has gets killed like a little bitch in the first movie. Coolest character this trilogy has? I'm gonna let you finish, but Mace Windu got a purple lightsaber. Shit, Negro, that's all you had to say. Much to learn, you still have. Are you still excited by this? Because that means you didn't see the last movie. But that logic doesn't really follow, does it? I mean, this movie isn't very good, but the next movie is one of the best in the franchise. I guess my point is that just because a movie is considered bad doesn't mean the next one will be. Besides, it's Star Wars. No matter what the haters say, we're always going to be excited for a new one. Opening text crawl continues to bore and delight everyone. Okay, that was a non-sin. You essentially said, here's a thing some people like, and a thing some people do not like. Cool story, bro, but why the f*** is that a sin? Aren't you siding with only one side of this topic? One that you acknowledge isn't sinful for a lot of people? What are you, Republican? The third paragraph of this crawl is about the exciting action of voting. Yeah, yeah, we get it. You don't care about the story in this movie. Thing is, some people do. This vote is important to the story the movie is trying to tell, because without that vote, you don't get the clones. And without the clones, you don't get the Clone Wars. That's a double entendre in case you missed it. I failed you, Senator. Well, you blew up instead of her, so I'd say that's pretty successful. Yeah, but they're referring to themselves dying before they could escort her to the vote. Is this what CinemaSins is supposed to be? Purposefully or accidentally misunderstanding what a movie is trying to say? I gotta say, only one of those is actually funny, and you're not doing the funny one. Senator Amidala, please. How does one go from queen to senator? Do you have to renounce your bloodline's claim to the throne? Is senator actually a higher office than queen to this society? I am so confused. Put it this way. You're watching a movie about aliens with alien technology and customs. Our concepts of queens and senators don't exactly apply. To answer the question, though, Amidala was voted in as Queen of Naboo, a single planet. Because that was an elected position, she fulfilled her term limit. Here, she is a senator in the Galactic Republic, an overarching form of government that presides over the entire galaxy. These are two separate things. We're keepers of the peace, not soldiers. Um, did the Jedi luck out with sporadic uprisings until this moment in time? How do they keep the peace with so few of them if there aren't enough to go to war? That's like having a National Guard based in Nebraska with 15 people in it who can go to Florida if need be, but are powerless if anything happens later in Texas. No, that's not at all what that's like. The Jedi are more akin to police officers. They have some jurisdiction, but if there is a war, the army would be the one to fight it. The dark side clouds everything. Let's just go ahead and say it, Yoda is useless as a prophet. I don't know. He called Anakin being a dickhead and Leia as being the other that would help destroy the Sith. Palpatine being just as powerful as Yoda, if not more so, isn't something wrong with this movie. It actually enhances it. Oh, I just realized. You don't realize that's what's going on here. Also, how does Palpatine have such amazing control of the dark side of the Force that none of these Jedi can sense it three feet away? Exactly my point from the previous sin. If Yoda is more or less equal in power to Palpatine and Yoda is considered the most powerful Jedi Force user, do I even need to finish this sentence? Impossible to see. The future is. And yet future prophecy bullshit. 
will drive everything we do from here on. This is what happens when you cut a movie up and remove quotes from their context. Yoda is saying that because the dark side is clouding their vision, they cannot currently see the future. This is blatant scene manipulation. The Count Dooku was once a Jedi. He couldn't assassinate anyone. It's not in his character. Did these assholes never once run into a Jedi who went to the dark side? Why does everyone fret about training someone like Anakin if that's the case? Sure, Darth Maul said something about revealing ourselves to the Jedi, but I thought he was implying they'd been gone a long time, not that they never existed. If we're speaking just canon, yeah, Dooku is the first Jedi turned Sith that the Council becomes aware of. Even if he weren't, the point is that the Jedi are too rigid and inflexible in their beliefs. This is something that leads to their eventual downfall. The reason they're wary of Anakin is because they have already sensed darkness inside him. You don't just sell Elliot Roger a gun after watching his YouTube videos. Annie? My goodness, you've grown. But you haven't. Hell, you guys are the same age now. I see we've reached the actors can't play other ages portion of the Cinema Sins video. Annie will always be that little boy I knew on Tatooine. So let's have kids together. Padme is only five years older than Anakin. She was 15 in the previous movie and 25 here. I don't know which galaxy you're living in, but a 20 year old having kids with a 25 year old ain't a big deal in the Milky Way. I hit the ship, but they used a decoy. We'll have to try something more subtle this time, Zem. Why? Because they attempted to assassinate Padme when she was on her way to Coruscant, and even then, they were wily enough to use a decoy. This means they're now aware of the threat on her life, and the only feasible way of killing her is something they wouldn't see coming. Ah, uh, she covered the cameras. I don't think she liked me watching her. Yeah, would anybody? Especially someone who basically led Dick first during the introductions a minute ago? This isn't a question the movie is answering. Padme just survived an attempt on her life, and Anakin and Obi-Wan have been assigned to protect her. The cameras are there so they can do their job. You're using her as bait. Why not use another decoy? Why not dress and drag in her bedroom while she sleeps on a nondescript floor of this building? Because this was Padme's idea. Besides, the movie itself states this plan was too risky. You're sending the film for something it already knows and blatantly acknowledges. Just being around her again is intoxicating. Good God, man. Anakin is already out of control. The guy needs to bang a hooker fast. Jeremy thinks a hooker is a suitable replacement for one soulmate. Something tells me Mrs. Sins wasn't the first choice. You've made a commitment to the Jedi Order, a commitment not easily broken. And which doesn't allow for the power of boners. And Jeremy says boner. If they know the exact floor and exact room Padme is sleeping in, why didn't they just program this thing to fire missiles into the room? Yeah, yeah, the assassins felt like they needed to be more subtle, but do you think people wouldn't be able to figure out this was foul play? Of course people would assume foul play. That's not the point. Going in loud would immediately raise the alarm, not allowing for a clean getaway. If Padme dies in her sleep, it may not be discovered for hours. The Chancellor doesn't appear to be corrupt. <laughs> I agree with the laugh, but still, the laugh. Now here's something extremely weird. Obi-Wan jumps and crashes through the window like a dick, through blinds and what is probably some tough-ass glass, even if it has a small hole in it. It's amazing it doesn't fall to his death right here. This is something unbecoming of his character, and something Anakin might more likely do since he's a hormone-based horn dog of a Jedi right now. I disagree. Not only has Obi-Wan demonstrated that he's a pretty good athlete, he's been shown throughout the series as a calculated risk-taker. This scene is supposed to demonstrate that Obi-Wan planned to do exactly what is shown and allowed the Force to guide his actions. You'd also think a subtle device like this might have a self-destruct button in order to evade evidence and capture but we I, again, agree that this probe should probably have this feature, but what about a self-destruct button is subtle again? In order to hide evidence, it would have to explode, right? Isn't that the same issue with the missiles? Whoa, wait, what's that? Is that my falling master in the middle of all this craziness? Ex machina to the rescue! Two sins here. One for, yet again, misusing the phrase deus ex machina. A character being saved is not a deus ex machina. A deus ex machina is when a conflict in a story is abruptly resolved with an unseen solution. The second sin ties into the first. The movie literally shows Anakin going for the vehicle. This means the solution to this problem was presented within the film and does not come from nowhere. You manipulated this scene. Jeez, how do they survive this shit? The answer is just because. So CinemaSins watched this scene and decided this wasn't the movie stating being shocked by power couplings isn't fatal. I wonder, if not the movie, where else are they getting that this should be fatal? Because this obvious fantasy film just said it isn't. Here's the problem. If you're going to explain he survives these things and somehow knows where Zam's ship is just because of the Force, you're going to have to do a better job of relaying that message. This is some serious bullshit right here. Although I could essentially repeat myself from the last sin to answer this question, this is precisely why I said what I said. CinemaSins literally asks for the movie to show them something, yet when that happens, they simply say it's bullshit and sin it anyway. There is no way for the movies to win. CinemaSins is Saw 3. 
Also, I thought Anakin wanted to see where the ship went, where the assassin went, and who she's working for. Instead, he just went right back to let's kill this asshole and doesn't seem the least bit concerned about the other knowledge. Yet another scene manipulation. The reason the speeder is on fire is because she attempted to shoot Anakin with a blaster, but he grabbed her hand before she could shoot him, which caused her to inadvertently shoot a panel. Anakin has not once tried killing this person. You want to go home and rethink your life? I want to go home and rethink my life. This is the only time Jedi mind tricks ever work. Once with a stormtrooper in the first movie and with this drug dealer in the fifth movie. First of all, you're wrong. Luke successfully used it against Bib Fortuna in Episode 6. Even if you weren't, the films told you the limitation in the first movie. It only works on the weak-minded. The irony here is that you made this video days before it was used again in The Force Awakens. This is why it doesn't pay to trend surf. The movie you're trying to capitalize on might make you look stupid. It was a bounty hunter cog! There's no chance in hell Django knew where anyone was and what time they'd be here. Just go right to hell with that Again, you are contradicting actual, tangible evidence. The movie is explicitly showing you that Django was aware of this, and you're sitting here saying, this thing that I am seeing doesn't exist. This is flat earther logic. What about Senator Amidala? She will still need protecting. Handle that. Your Padawan will. I sensed he cared deeply about his mother and didn't want to train him because of that earlier. But now I can't sense this horny teenager's desire and will make him the primary guard for Amidala. Yep. Still missing basic plot points, I see. Obi-Wan and Anakin were already assigned to her detail, mainly because of Palpatine's manipulation. Since Obi-Wan is now being tasked with tracking down Jango Fett, this leaves Anakin to do exactly what he was already doing. As for why they cannot see his feelings for Padme, Yoda mentioned earlier that the dark side is clouding their vision. This is also Palpatine's doing. The boy has exceptional skills. But he still has much to learn, Master. Somehow, between the last movie and this one, Obi-Wan and the Jedi Council have completely reversed their roles on the idea of Anakin as a Jedi. Even if that were true, hint, it's not, this scene isn't even showing that. All Mace Windu is saying is that Anakin has shown he is skillful. This does not automatically translate into being a Jedi. Darth Maul is skillful, for example. Does that mean Mace would be implying he's Jedi material too? Too sure of themselves they are. Maybe it's that constant fear leads to the dark side tripe you've been preaching this whole time that makes them more confident than they should be. There is a clear difference between confidence and arrogance. Confidence is when you're sure of yourself. Arrogance is when you're full of yourself. Here's an example of the latter. Let this be known, let this be known, I am not a... Are you sure about that? He's overly critical. He never listens. Where the f*** did this come from? You were just talking about making sure she's safe, and it turned into a diatribe about how life's unfair to you. Well, if you didn't cut the scene to shit, you would have seen the segue into this dialogue. Anakin demonstrates he has matured, to which Padme says he's grown. He then says, Obi-Wan manages not to see it. It's amazing how you ask questions where the answers are simply a matter of watching the film. It's not fair. Padme will not only ignore this childishness, but go on to enter a sexual relationship with this whiny baby. Hey man, even Donald Trump has managed to have like 16 kids with three different women, one of whom he would totally bone if it weren't socially unacceptable. Please don't look at me like that. Why not? Because it feels like you want to f*** me with your lightsaber, you creepy bastard. Jeremy says... Rose Byrne and Natalie Portman are not my sister wives in this scene. That sounds awfully Alabama for a Tennessean. Don't do anything without first consulting either myself or the council. Especially f***ing this queen, you hear? <laughs> Look at that. Ignoring the movie giving context to Anakin's earlier rant. And for what? A joke nobody laughed at? Um, the official subtitles here say that R2-D2 gave that cook robot raspberries. What the f***? There is no way you're a grown-ass man and have never come across the phrase blowing raspberries. That's like thinking someone means actual soup when they say soup's on. I'll be with the people that I love. You do not love her yet! You haven't even seen her in 10 years. You have a boner. That's it. How does Jedi training not include sex ed? This precludes the possibility of Anakin having fallen in love with her in Episode 1. Not to mention he's been spending time with her now, recently. Not to not mention you also said boner. Because someone erased it from the archive memory. Oh, come on. So let me get this straight. Just on the off chance someone was looking for this planet for whatever reason, someone decided to erase it from the archives. <laughs> this is incredible. You're literally asking why someone who is attempting to pull the biggest coup in the galaxy would want to cover their tracks. Are you fucking stupid? Also, they removed the planet, but they didn't remove anything else that might help someone locate it? 
That gives you, like, the opposite effect of what you're trying to accomplish, right? Might as well put a neon sign there that said, Planet removed for incriminating purposes. Which is an interesting position to take, considering you just said this. And why would anyone be looking for this planet? Except when someone finds a rare poison dart that only the chef at a diner could recognize. So which is it? Is Camino absurdly difficult to find, or is it absurdly easy to find? You're speaking out of both sides of your mouth, Hillary Clinton. Apparently R2 navigates stairs one by one, very slowly, but can catch up to them no problem, even though they never stop. It's almost like R2 is on wheels. I heard they even tried to amend the Constitution so you could stay in office. She was a queen, though, right? Not an elected official. Or does this planet just elect people and call them queens? Yes. The day we stop believing democracy can work is the day we lose it. Let's pray that day never comes. You have a queen in this world, right? Isn't that a monarchy? Or are you like the British monarchy where you have a queen but she has no power? I could go on a long soliloquy explaining what I already explained in Sin Number 5, but I think it's funnier to point out CinemaSins literally thinks Naboo's queens are queens of the entire galaxy. There it is, R4. Yep, the planet we've probably seen for many, many parsecs because it is a huge celestial body in space. I am just now acknowledging that I see it. Yet another obvious scene manipulation. Obi-Wan has only just come out of hyperspace. He did not see Kamino until right before he said this line. I don't get it. This movie is ass. You don't have to make things up to shit on it. That's like making up reasons why Nickelback sucks when their discography is right there. You will be delighted to hear that we are on schedule. All these people need to know is that Obi-Wan is a Jedi, and they just blab the whole evil plan to him before making sure it's okay to tell him. Because the order for the clones was from the Jedi. Dude, keep up. I don't like sand. It's coarse and rough and irritating, and it gets everywhere. Never a more eloquent word was spoken in order to woo a fine woman. Sending this line. We take great pride in our combat education and training programs. But we don't spend much time on aiming practice. Jeremy, along with a lot of other normies, thinks the clone troopers are stormtroopers. Actually, the first generation of stormtroopers. No one apparently told Django that a Jedi was coming because he left his incriminating in the closet completely out in the open for anyone to see. Lord Bert Patine, if the movie has spent a considerable amount of time explaining Camino had been annexed from the records, why does Jeremy pretend Django would assume the Jedi tailing him would show up here? The mind of an idiot is a perplexing thing indeed, Penguin. It's like a writer thinking a protagonist assuming the name of someone they barely have any connection to is something that should exist. Absolute bad the fodder. They'll do their job well. A whole army of Django Fets, and somehow the bad guys are going to lose this thing. It's almost like the bad guys actually win and dominate the galaxy for 24 years. Something something double dipping, something something this should have been one video. Dad! No! Whoa, what the hell is going on? How did we get here? Obi-Wan fist fights with this dude instead of force choking him or force pushing him or any of the other non-hand-to-hand -hand force attacks. I let two sins play to demonstrate something I've always said about cinema sins. They will sometimes say something completely random about an innocuous scene in order to segue into a scene they actually have a problem with. Seriously, the only reason they included the first one was so them sending the fight scene here wouldn't seem out of place. Ah yes, of course. I remembered to bring my throwable homing beacon that instantly sticks to anything I throw it towards. In cinema sins land, they don't have magnets. Get him, Dad! Get him! Fire! Boba Fett, ladies and gentlemen. It's Boba Fett, my guy. I know you're from Tennessee and all, but not everyone is named Bubba. Owen Lars, uh, this is my girlfriend, Baru. Let me get this straight. The powers that be decided that Luke would someday come to live here, even though Anakin met Owen and Baru? He didn't think that would be a huge risk? It's almost like nobody knows they're here. Not that I'm complaining, but Padme decided to wear the super hot ab-bearing outfit to go meet Annie's mom. Ah, uh, 2015. Back when the guy who would become known for virtue signaling tried to police what women wore. This movie doesn't earn the dark side transformation of Anakin. He was a whiny kid for most of this movie, and now he massacres a bunch of Tuscans. Had someone been here to stop him, and that need for revenge festered in his heart? The next time would be a good time for a massacre. Most of everything we know about Anakin was talked about, not shown, and this comes off as rushed. It's almost like it takes a whole nother movie to earn the dark side transformation. Why'd she have to die? She probably didn't, but you left her alone here as a slave on this planet to pursue your own Jedi goals. What did you think was going to happen to her? Happily ever after? Well, if you paid attention to the previous movie, you'd have your answer. I will come back and free you, Mom. I promise. And not just the men, but the women and the children, too. Anakin can somehow tell Tuscan women and children from the men. I'm not even mad. That's amazing. Well, that's kind of easy when they look like this. It's carrying a message from an Obi-Wan Kenobi. And Master Annie, does that name mean anything to you? I wonder if he means old Ben. Jeremy makes a pop culture reference that isn't a sin of the film cliche. Hey there, Star Wars fan. FYI, R2-D2 can fly. 
you. Yep, this part of the film has always been rank bullshit. It's ironic to me that all the people that hate the sequel trilogy conveniently miss this retcon but have a problem with the they fly now scene. They fly now? I'm so confused. Maybe that explains why you aren't funny anymore. Irony. Movie is an asshole. That is the very definition of cheating and filmmaking, you f***er. This is equivalent to telling your mother you have terminal cancer, and then when she starts sobbing, you trash talk about how you pranked her and how stupid she is. <laughs> you mad, bro? I truly, deeply love you. George Lucas thinks people talk this way. Lucas's only sin here is thinking women talk this way. Men are the ones that say this. Just ask any woman who has received a Facebook message from a random Indian guy. This creature basically didn't want to kill Amidala. Just make her sexier. It says a lot about a person that thinks wounding someone makes them sexier. This thing is terrible at thingy. <laughs> Alright, I laughed. <laughs> Star Wars finally gives us a nerdgasm scene with dozens of Jedi and lightsabers all at once. And I'd take a sin or two off if I hadn't had to sit through two movies of mostly boring bullshit to finally get this. Jeremy sends something he likes, cliche. <laughs> The Death Star is apparently fully operational in, like, 20 years. They must have had a million contractors working 24-7 on that thing. The Great Pyramid at Giza only took about 20 years to build, and they didn't have the advanced technology of the Empire. Only slaves. And spit. You're gonna pay for all the Jedi that you killed today, Dooku. Saying things! Make fun of CinemaSins without making fun of CinemaSins. Electricity. Curiously, a trait only Dark Side Force users have. Do you even hear yourself? Dark side force user. If there is a such thing as a side, surely that side will have abilities exclusive to them. Otherwise, the f**k's the point of a side? Let's talk about Palpatine's plan. Let's not. In the name of the Galactic Senate of the Republic, you're under arrest, Chancellor. Are you threatening me, Master Jedi? The Senate will decide your fate. It's treason. I'll admit, this shit's gonna feel weird under a Disney logo. As I've told you before for the Marvel properties, once Disney absorbs a company, you won't see Fox's or any other logo. Did you see that logo for episode 7 or 8? Exactly. <sighs> Tradition for tradition's sake. Hilariously ironic, considering the entire premise of your channel and the lap dance sin. Also, reading. You know, I find this sin to be really weird, considering the first motion pictures almost exclusively had reading. How is this a cinema sin if reading has always been a part of film? These two ships are doing absolutely nothing except making a long, unbroken shot possible. Of course, when it's all a cartoon, how impressive is that? Wait, what was that? Of course, when it's all a cartoon, how impressive is that? One more time. How impressive is that? In impressive? How impressive is that? How impressive is that? How impressive, how impressive, how impressive. <laughs> Also, this brings to light the fact that there appears to be no solid military plan involved on either side. Hey, just send all your ships out and we'll flip a coin. Heads we die, tails we die. Well, oh, Someone's gotta win, might as well be us. How exactly do you think dogfighting should go, Jeremy? Oh, you're not going to offer an alternative? Got it. The General's command ship is dead ahead. Still, like four minutes ago you said the same thing. General Grievous' ship is directly ahead. Neither it nor you moved or changed direction in the last four minutes. Space is big, yo. Oh, I have a bad feeling about this. In earlier uses of this line, it was always in a situation that was undefined. The person saying it didn't know why they got a bad feeling, but they got it nonetheless. Now you're just sticking it in for lip service. Amazing. The guy that has random ass running gags angry at a running gag. What, not enough apples, asshole? If only the bad guys in these movies had made their ships less R2 compatible, they would have won the shit. R2-D2 is an astromech droid, a kind of droid that helps with flying or the repairing of starships. They are basically essential in the Star Wars universe, and that explains their ubiquity. So it's come to this, a coughing robot. General Grievous is a cyborg, not a robot. R2 continues to accidentally himself out of every situation he finds himself in. Yeah, but this isn't a case of that. He sprays the oil on them and ignites them with his jets on purpose. Sith Lords are our speciality. Yeah, except for Qui-Gon. Too soon? Okay, Qui-Gon was defeated by Maul, but Obi-Wan defeated him, right? I mean, he's not saying Sith Lords were Qui-Gon's specialty. Also, you faced one Sith Lord by my count, and you only beat him because Qui-Gon softened him up. Whoa, softened him up? What the hell does that even mean? They were fighting with lightsabers. Softening someone up means cutting them at the very least, and Maul was completely healthy during their one-on-one. -on -one. My powers have doubled since the last time we met Count. I rolled a 20-sided die and got a million extra hit points, so come at me, bro. Jeremy pretends like he knows anything about Dungeons and Dragons. 
Robots enter this Jedi battle to make things extra pointless. So you all heard that ding while this fool was talking, right? <laughs> I'm better at doing y'all's job than you are. One sin for CinemaSins' editing team. He cut off your arm, and you wanted revenge. Feel as old as- Skip! Aside from the coughing, which is dumb as hell, how does a robot get promoted through the ranks so quickly and become a general? What the fuck is this nonsense? Again, Grievous isn't a robot. He was a Kalish warlord who cybernetically enhanced his body after suffering severe injuries. The Separatist droid army were built for him and the Confederacy of Independent Systems. 8 plus 60. <laughs> this fucking laugh. Landing strip straight ahead. We're coming in too hot. Too hot for 10 miles of runway? How is that possible? First of all, this is nowhere near 10 miles. Second, too hot is a reference to their angle and speed, meaning they're going too fast for their orientation and have no way to control their level. Well, the first 24 minutes of this thing are some bullshit, but it's still better than the Trade Federation negotiations. Jeremy sends something he likes cliche. There were whispers that you'd been killed. Why? Who knew the situation enough to make any kind of speculation? Isn't that exactly what speculation is? People talking about something they know jack shit about? What are we gonna do? Okay, I have an elaborate plan that involves you dying, me turning evil, and our twins not knowing they're related for almost 30 years. What do you say? Dude, none of this shit is a sin. Come on. The happiest moment of my life. Except when my mom died and I slaughtered all those Tusken Raiders, but this is a close second. For the moment, I'm going to ignore the fact that you've sinned this specific scene like five separate times, each of them more ridiculous than the last, but this is the icing on the cake. This man just said that the time Anakin killed the Tusken Raiders was the happiest moment in his life. It was so beautiful. She's okay, but have you seen her decoy? Yes, we have. And while Kira Knightley is stunning, have you seen Natalie Portman eating hot wings? But it's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> In the span of one movie. No, no, no. We're not just going to let you get away with that weak sauce fake ass laugh. I doubt the queen will continue to allow me to serve in the Senate. How do you go from queen to senator, but then the replacement queen has more power than you do? Is this monarchy not based on birthright? Is the queen elected, but then still called a queen? Yes. Yourself, you speak of? Or someone you know? There's no way Anakin is holding back all of his feelings right now. This guy wears his whole life on his sleeve, and yet, the Force tells Yoda nothing. Okay, you've made a couple allusions to the fact that the Jedi aren't aware of Padme's pregnancy, so here's the explanation. The Jedi have no direct interest in Padme currently. The Force doesn't just passively give them information. They have to concentrate and use the Force. Because they, frankly, don't give a shit about Padme, they have no reason to actively use the Force and figure out her situation. The fear of loss is a path to the dark side. What isn't a path to the dark side, huh? Well, for one, the opposite of what Yoda just said. Train yourself to let go of everything you fear to lose. Seems like this would have been Jedi 101, with Obi-Wan teaching Anakin this on the first day of class, especially since the whole Jedi Council didn't want to train him because of that very reason. It was Jedi 101. This is a lesson they've been trying to teach Anakin from the beginning, or at least since episode two. I guess this guy is somewhere on some other planet, sitting in a chair with the exact dimensions of this chair? Yeah? Is that so unbelievable? I mean, in this scene, there's a green alien speaking English to a conehead through a hologram, but the fucking chair is what's blowing your mind? Anakin did not take to his new assignment with much enthusiasm. It's very dangerous putting them together. Seems like maybe you three could have prevented a galactic disaster, but just didn't for some reason. Well, that's probably because they're religious, and like all religious people, they believe in their prophecies despite all evidence to the contrary. With all due respect, Master, is he not the Chosen One? With all due respect, Obi, were you not voicing your own concerns about him in the last f***ing movie? He has come to trust and believe in Anakin. This is Obi-Wan showing character growth, you idiot. Also, I didn't ever think it would come to this, but I'm sinning love. Sinning love. The Jedi use their power for good. Good is a point of view, Anakin. Anakin's mind is more easily manipulated than a first grader's. Palpatine is 100% correct here, though. Good and bad are simply points of view. A lion destroying an Impala is bad from the Impala's perspective, but think of the starving lion cubs back at the den. Did you ever hear the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise? Shh, quiet. I'm trying to watch the electric bubble show, dude. Not removing ten sins for Darth Plagueis the Wise. He could use the Force to influence the midi-chlorians to create life. What purpose did it serve for Darth Plagueis to impregnate me? Your ignorance of the Star Wars lore is showing. 
Plagueis didn't impregnate Shmi. He and Sidious attempted to influence the midichlorians to create a weapon for the Sith, and in retaliation, the midichlorians created Anakin to destroy the Sith. We are being held hostage. They are watching us. But not closely enough, apparently. Speaking of not watching closely enough, this was the goddamn scene where Obi-Wan mentioned fuel. When did Obi-Wan learn to ride one of these random bastards? Varactyls are basically the horses of Utapau. So what you're really asking is when did Obi-Wan learn to ride a horse? Be thankful, Viceroy. You have not found yourself in my grief. Grievous sounds exactly like Ceres from Galaxy Quest. Okay. I've been trained in your Jedi arts by Count Dooku. When did you guys have time for that? In the time frame between episode two and three. Seriously, why do you think just asking a question constitute a sin of these movies? They have answers, goddammit. What's better than one or two lightsabers? Four lightsabers. <sighs> you must realize you are doomed. Saying things. Irony. I sense a plot to destroy the Jedi. The dark side of the Force surrounds the Chancellor. Oh, so you guys got your ability to see more clearly now? The dark side's been clouding your vision all the way up until now. I guess the Force simply acts according to the whim of the screenwriter. Bullshit! They've been distrusting of Palpatine this entire film! Remember? Making Anakin spy on him? Don't you wonder why they won't make you a Jedi Master? Don't you wonder why Anakin is so powerful in the Force but so blind to this super obvious manipulation? Anakin was already upset at the Jedi for not making him a Master, and at their disapproval of his relationship with Padme. It's not so much manipulation as it is appealing to his already raw feelings. And you will be able to save your wife from certain death. Except not, and when Padme still dies, it makes no sense that Anakin Vader doesn't then go into berserker mode and consume the entire galaxy, or at least kill Palpatine for lying. In his pursuit of a remedy for Padme's impending death, Anakin commits murder, betrays the Jedi Order, and uses the dark side of the Force. He was a broken man, and Palpatine was the only one that would take him in at that point. It actually makes a lot of sense. You're under arrest, Chancellor. You didn't even get a scene where they tell Yoda about Palpatine. No, 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 no. You're not about to send one of the most badass scenes in Star Wars. How did this asshole become a Jedi if he's so damn easy to kill? And Mr. No-Name here too? This scene is basically a meme in the Star Wars community, but it's supposed to elicit the idea that Palpatine himself is a badass. Emperor versus Mace Windu battle really heats things up with a big load of boring. Wait, what? You know what, Future Birdman? You wanna go fly to Tennessee and pull up on CinemaSins? You know I'm always riding, big dog. I'm surprised a big turkey power-up icon didn't show up on screen, or a big pile of money. Jeremy makes a pop culture ref- Henceforth, you shall be known as Darth Vader. I don't know why that name popped into my head, especially since everybody else has not-so-subtle Darth names like Maul, Sidious, and Plagueis. But I'm not married to it. Let's see what happens. So we're going to pretend that Vader isn't the coolest Darth name? Splitting this video into two separate videos because double the views, am I right? This is all we see of Yoda during this entire section of the movie. He just feels something is wrong. He doesn't do anything that ever makes us appreciate the character from Empire Strikes Back. The guy who told us do not try is the least doing character in this entire trilogy. Besides being a playful old hermit, what exactly did Yoda do in Empire? Oh, nothing? Okay. I want you to go to the Jedi Temple. We will catch them off balance. Somehow they'll not feel all this evil bullshit going on right now and won't detect you when you come to slaughter all the kids. Dude, what the fuck? You just played a scene of Yoda demonstrating that he does in fact feel all this evil bullshit and are now pretending like the Jedi don't realize what's going on. Oh, f*** you. I can't believe these movies actually made me hate Yoda so much. There are CG animators out there who got tired of all the ways they had to draw Yoda feeling bad about something. But you just... It, you just showed... The, God damn... <sighs> Jeremy feigns ignorance cliche. They took forever to kill him, and now I'm supposed to have a boner because Yoda killed two guys. Jeremy says boner. As long as you throw the Emperor down a shaft later, all these kids' deaths will be forgiven. Eh, not really. I mean, the only person that forgave him was Luke, and Luke wasn't even born when this event took place. If I had told you at the outset that two of the three prequel movies would contain scenes of Obi-Wan swimming underwater, would you have believed me? Because I don't think you would have. Who gives a shit? Swimming isn't a sin. Unless you're swimming in puss- I heard there was an attack on the Jedi Temple. You can see the smoke from here. Um, yeah, that Jedi Temple getting attacked scene was intense. I heard a lot of harrowing dialogue about it. Okay, but they just showed you a montage of Jedi being attacked, and you've been nitpicking it. Are you seriously asking us to believe that you wanted to see the Jedi Temple being attacked? <laughs> Shut the fuck up. This lava moon's orbit is so close to its giant ass planet, I'm surprised it hasn't burned up in the atmosphere yet. Jeremy thinks this sentence makes any sense at all. This fool just suggested that a ball of fire could burn even more. 
Who the f*** said, yeah, definitely need to build an outpost on this moon? Oh, I guess I should read this line again. Mustafar is a planet, not a moon. And second, that would be the Klegger Mining Corporation initially, and Darth Vader eventually, as Mustafar's core contained a conduit for the dark side of the Force. There. And I still want my biscuits, JXE. Don't think I forgot about them. Anakin kills the 33 people necessary in order to attain orange eyes. Jeremy makes a pop culture reference that isn't a sin of the film cliche. So this is how Liberty dies. With thunderous applause. <laughs> what it sounds like when Jeremy is beating off. Use your feelings, Obi-Wan, and find him you will. Since when do a Jedi's feelings work in these movies? A New Hope, Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi, The Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones, this movie, pretty much every film except the new trilogy. Why doesn't Obi-Wan just play the incriminating security video of Anakin killing children for her? Because she's pregnant, and that level of stress could technically harm the babies. I mean, she does die from a broken heart in this movie. <laughs> I could barely say that without laughing. Anakin is the father, isn't he? You seriously didn't know that already? God damn, can Jedi sense shit or fing not? Again, the Jedi had no reason to use the Force when it came to Padme. At best, they could probably sense conflict within Anakin, but the Force is not fing Mori Povich. You are the Force! <laughs> also, I guess Obi Wan didn't search his feelings about Anakin's whereabouts. He just happened to know someone who knew the information he needed. Yeah. Padme. Obi-Wan brings Padme to the lava planet for his kill of Anakin, because what could possibly go wrong? I'm going to ignore that ridiculous pronunciation of possibly in order to point out that Jeremy doesn't realize that Obi-Wan knows that Padme knows where Anakin is and is stowing away on her ship. This guy really thinks that Obi-Wan is the one bringing her to Mustafar while showing Obi-Wan sneaking onto the ship and hiding. How does that make any sense? Anakin, you're breaking my heart. Why do we hate this line so much? Is it because the badass character Padme we saw in Phantom Menace going around leading an assault on the Viceroy has become a lump of melodramatic mush? This is the man she loves and the father of her children. Come on, dude, her being a badass has nothing to do with her heart being broken. Jeremy doesn't know shit about women. This is what it's all been leading towards, Obi-Wan fighting Anakin. And it's really kind of the letdowniest of all letdowns. Fifteen sins for calling the duel on Mustafar a letdown. Yoda takes this lightning blast as if he wasn't expecting the Emperor to be evil or something. Jeremy continues to misunderstand that Sidious is powerful as f**k. At last, the Jedi are no more. Not if anything to say about it, I have. Good job, movie. You made me want Frank Oz to shut up, somehow. Sinning Frank Oz. Not much but dual lightsaber duels going on right now. But I wonder, the Emperor had a tough time with Mace Windu during their duel, so how does he keep up with Yoda, who is flipping all around as super fast and is mostly considered to be the best Jedi up until recently? What does being the best Jedi even mean? Are you suggesting that Yoda is the best sword fighter? Because, uh-uh, that would be Mace Windu, which is why Palpatine struggled in their duel. Into exile, I must go. Failed, I have. I know we need a reason why Yoda goes to Dagobah, but he very much gave up the fight with the Emperor too soon. All the cool stuff Yoda did in the past 10 minutes, forget about it. This is the movie suggesting that Yoda realizes that he cannot defeat the Emperor. How fortunate is it that this tower stays upright while floating down a river of lava it's being consumed- Oh f it, my lack of interest should be beyond obvious by now. Just tell me when it's over. You say this shit, but this is only halfway into the second part of this video you unnecessarily cut into two parts. Wait, aren't they powering their pieces of metal junk to fly over this lava pit? Seems like this is a talent that could have gotten a lot more use over time. Basically, this means you can fly, as long as you have a thing underneath you. Jeremy thinks these platforms that were obviously designed to float over the lava on this planet are being controlled by the Jedi to fly. You can't make this shit up. It's over, Anakin! I have the high ground! So did Darth Maul, and you saw how that turned out. Except if you paid attention to that fight, you'd have realized Darth Maul was being overconfident. He assumed that since he'd defeated the Master, the student stood no chance, and as he had him in a compromised position, he'd easily win. Obi-Wan doesn't make mistakes like that. Hell, you could consider this him learning from that experience. Medically, she's completely healthy. Are there really no human doctors left in this world? Everyone here gets treated by a big hero six dressed in Johnny Five clothing. Based on this sentence, I'm going to assume when you say human, you mean non-robotic being, and then I'd point to the at least three of those beings in this very scene. If you actually mean human and are discounting those beings in the back, that's racist. Luke. Padme names her kids as they exit her womb, which is simply unnatural. Jeremy thinks it's unnatural to name children at childbirth. It seems in your anger, you killed her. 
Darth Vader believes this. Because it's the truth? Also, wow, lying liars and the lies they tell. Isn't he already Darth Vader? Does he really still need manipulating? He's telling him the truth. We must take them somewhere where the Sith will not sense their presence. We'll take Luke to somewhere like, I don't know, Anakin's old home planet. Why the hell not? Well, if you think about it, Tatooine is the perfect place to hide Luke from Anakin. There's a shit ton of sand. Isn't Vader still badly burned? Did they ever give him anything for that? You see the black suit? The helmet? The iconic breathing apparatus? Nope, they never gave him anything for his injuries. Nothing. 